Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm David Isaacs with the Semiconductor Industry Association. And um, this webinar is a, a collaboration between the SIA and the Semiconductor Research Corporation uh, to discuss the decadal plan for semiconductors. And today's focus is on new trajectories for analog electronics. As everyone knows, computing and information and communications technology is the growth engine of the, the economy and the modern world and analog technology. The topic of today's webinar is a key part of this transformation as analog technology plays a key role in the interface with the modern world. And, and uh, this technology is increasingly important in market segments across the economy, ranging from manufacturing and robotics to health and in the environment and infrastructure and, and transportation. The main goal of this webinar today is to identify the research agenda of the decadal plan for semiconductors to discover new approaches uh, to intelligent sensing and future analog challenges. You can read the full decadal plan at the SRC website. And today we will hear from the decadal plan committee, which is made up of some of the foremost leaders in research and development in engineering in the semiconductor industry, academia, and the national labs. The panel will be moderated by Dave Robertson of Analog Devices, and our panelists will include Wai Li from Texas Instruments, Dr. Stephen Spurgeon of the Pacific Northwest National Lab, Mark Rodwell from uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, Bar uh, Boris Merman of Stanford University, and Kostis Doris of NXP. The bios of all of our panelists are on uh, the webpage, and the session will kick off with remarks from Jim Weiser of, of Texas Instruments. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much, David, for the introduction and the, the kickoff here. Uh, as uh, he mentioned, I'm Jim Weiser, Director of University Research and Technology for Texas Instruments. And welcome you all to the future analog electronics and intelligence sensing SIA webinar connected with a decadal plan as David just highlighted. Uh, that decadal plan full report is available and was released in January if you want to get into, into more detail. Next slide, please. So just quickly summarizing and briefly going over what the decadal plan is, it identified five seismic shifts and there were five workshops one for each one of these to look into them in much more detail with experts across the industry. The first one was analog, which we'll be talking about more today. Then uh, there was one on memory and storage, one on communications, one on security, and then one on compute energy. And that was the subject of a prior SIA webinar uh, a month or two ago. So uh, please again, look at the full report for that. We'll be talking more about the analog area uh, where fundamentals our fundamental breakthroughs in analog hardware are required to generate smarter world machine interfaces that can sense, perceive, and reason. Next slide, please. So one of the questions that does come up in many people's minds is what is analog? And analog is really the interface to the real world. And it includes sight and vision, hearing and sound, smell, and any sense, including gas sensing, so to speak, touch, these are all, of course, human senses, which are also important for machines and robotics. But then there's also communications, which is a very much an analog technology and power conversion, distribution, charging and so forth, as well as the automation and electric vehicles. And then finally, in the area of drones and robotics, which are important for the industrial space. So all these things are interfaces to the real world and analog. Next click, please. These all end up driving analog technologies and analog electronics, which is where the semiconductor industry comes into play. And these really cover a wide gamut of areas, including computation, control, data conversion, in other words, converting from analog to digital and back from digital to analog again, power, as I mentioned earlier, communications, instrumentation, and importantly, physical world interfaces, which is what we'll focus on mostly today. And this uh, fine area of physical world interfaces is where that interface to the real world occurs. Next slide, please. 
So what we have here is the interface to the real world. And this analog interface real world leads to a tremendous amount of sensing that's going to be necessary. It's estimated that by 2032, there'll be 45 trillion sensors that will be producing tremendous amounts of data, something we've termed the data deluge from analog sensing into the world. And specifically, it looks like estimate of 10 to the 20 bits per second will be generated from all these sensors worldwide. This red line that is in this chart to the right indicates this exponential ramp of data. And noticeably, the green line is what human capacity is. If you look at all the total humans on the earth and what their capacity of digesting data is, and we've already surpassed that. Now, humans aren't the only ones that are going to digest data. There will be machines as well. And the more we, intelligent we can make those sensors, the better that they will be. And the less data has to be determined and processed and more what will happen will be the information will be utilized and leveraged. Much of this data clearly is not utilized in some way. It's just not used or it's lost. So we need to come up with solutions in order to be able to address that. We've set for the decadal plan, an analog grand goal is to produce revolutionary technologies which will increase actionable information with less energy, really to enable efficient and low latency, in other words, very timely information and sensing to analog to information with a practical reduction ratio of 100,000 to one, which is a very aggressive goal. Next slide, please. So we have these new trajectories for analog electronics and the interface to the real world. These areas in the decadal plan are addressing multiple areas of uh, technology. There's the sensor itself, the sensing, and then of course the signal processing behind that. There are also many other energy efficient functions such as communications, computing and processing and power conversion and management. One other area that's been identified is that we can take inspiration from biology, which has evolved to be extremely efficient over the years. And by using this bio-inspired model, we can possibly address this goal to reduce data down to a significant amount. The key is to leverage the best domain and data representation and technology for the function needed, but not more than needed. And that's something, again, that uh, we have to be careful of. We only need to do what is necessarily to take action. It's not necessarily to reconstruct all the, the information again, such as what is done in, today in, in video and audio for entertainment, but most of the sensing is gonna be done because we need to take some action. The decadal plan actually identified a few priority research themes, and we'll touch on um, much of those at the very end of this presentation. But on the right side of the slide, the topmost is the sensing to action. How do we take this data and take real world action on it and be able to do it with a good reduction in the amount of data that needs to be transmitted and so forth? And it's not gonna be possible without some integrated system solutions with significant increase in the design methods and productivity to be able to produce those designs in a timely manner. The next four areas that are on this slide really all feed into this, whether it's looking at more trainable signal converters, things that have more intelligence, of course, the analog bio-inspired inspired machine learning and leveraging analog technology for some computation, not all, but some, and then extending sensing capabilities into the terahertz regime, which will provide us higher levels of capability, be able to do things with longer distances as well as higher resolution, and then, of course, the last being how do we actually design these devices and so forth in a timely manner. Next slide, please. So one question that comes up is how do we come up with this 100,000 to one data reduction or dimensionality reduction? And again, we look at the biology and in fact, the human division system as inspiration for this. If we look at this on the left hand side of the slide is really a model of the eye and the which is really the sensor, the, the retina and the sensor, which takes in a tremendous amount of light quanta, if you will, and heads it off into various le levels and layers in order to reduce this down into what's useful and needed information, if you will. 
as a very first step. And this is really the sensor itself that has this intelligence, if you will, or the selectivity. And that quanta takes it down to photoreceptors, cones and rods. There's readout connectivity within the, the eye and the retina, bipolar terminals, and then on to the ganglion cells, which generate the spikes to the optic nerve. This reduction results in sens some sensitivity loss, but is traded off by the fact that it saves energy and it reduces communications throughout the body and, and the brain, so to speak. But beyond that, if you look towards the right, we end up with about effectively, it's estimated about 10 megabits per second of information that goes into the brain out of the optic nerve. This is then reduced through layered processing that's highly specialized in the brain, specifically for vision, and it results in only about 100 bits per second of conscious bits that the brain looks at. So from that reduction right there, you look at it's about 100,000 to one. And so that's somewhat where we get our inspiration. But the vision system is only one of these areas that we can take that inspiration from. Also, hearing does something very, very similar. It does a lot of processing in the ear and the cochlea itself. The nose and the smell picking up different gases and so forth. Tremendous amount of sensors and reduction, sending minimal messages to the brain, and then taste being another one. So we can take inspiration from all of these and learn from this biology to be bio-inspired, not necessarily to mimic exactly the process that's going on, but to understand that there is this layered hierarchical system, if you will, that has specialized capability to reduce data down to something that's very effective to be able to be used by the brain. And then of course the brain transmits simple signals out and then there are other processes hierarchically that actually take action in the body as necessary. Next slide, please. So this is a model of how we look at this sensing as a system rather than as a sensor or as a signal processing problem or as a communication problem and so forth. So it is a hierarchical system. And we basically realized that we cannot send all this data that's coming off the sensors directly to the cloud. It would just overstress the communication systems as well as other processing and energy that would be needed to do that. Communication would be a huge bottleneck. The pro power to process the redundant data is not efficient. So we need to reduce that data down effectively, much like the human body does. And also, more importantly, as we get into some control algorithms and so forth, latency becomes a real problem if you have to send things a long distance and communicate them. So by keeping things local, we can have intelligent sensors that provide local and, and timely action in order to be able to do this. When we look at this, we wanna look at the overall system. This locality also has an important piece of keeping data local, which minimizes the amount of communication as mentioned earlier, but also can help from a security standpoint by not transmitting data long distances and causing more attack surfaces to be available. As such, this is a very hierarchical model as well. And the way that we need to address this is looking at similar to the human body as we take that inspiration, the sensor itself, how that could be more selective, intelligent, the signal conditioning, whether it be analog, digital, a combination of both, could be analog computation even, or machine learning and so forth, which leads into a local intelligence block where we can actually make decisions locally, take that decision, create an actionable decision and then drive an actuator of some sort, whether it's telling an individual to do something or having a machine take specific action, even to be shutting down if there's a diagnostic capability of sensing and finding out that there's going to be a problem, a catastrophic problem. In that local intelligence, of course, there's local information that needs to be stored. But in some cases, there will be select information much smaller amount of information and data that needs to go to the cloud. And this helps from a global processing standpoint, let's say a factory or infrastructure management and so forth, where some minimal energy mess, uh, messages are necessary. And it will be stored and uh, pulling everything together from a large, say, area and using it more global intelligence 
and feeding back a little bit of data back to the local system to try to make sure everything's running more, more efficiently. So it, it should be noted that this works in a lot of applications. Obviously it's not gonna work for every application. And so our 100,000 to one goal is quite extensive, quite aggressive, and it will not apply to every situation, but the vision of being able to do that will have big impact as we go forward. Next slide, please. So we've identified in the decadal plan, some required research where we think there's some large needs and where it can have significant impact. First, as we highlighted earlier, we take a system view. We basically look at the study of a holistic solution and make sure that we have that holistic solution to look at all aspects, such as the diagram that was in the prior slide. It needs to be collaborative. It needs to have multiple expertise and have research projects with demonstrator platforms that can actually indicate the value that we would have in producing such a system. And we also need to have, as I mentioned earlier, effective design methods to make that more effective. Next, there's gonna be a need for heterogeneous integration. As you saw in the diagram, there's multiple functions that need to be pulled together locally. It needs to be power efficient. In many cases, size is important, weight's important. Of course, energy efficiency, if it's battery operated, is extremely important. And we'll need to be able to pull different technologies to do that. In some cases, it's going to be a CMOS platform integration, which has been carrying us through decades with additional optimized technologies, which you hear a bit about later on during the panel. Package integration is also going to be very important to be able to pull these dissimilar technologies together. In fact, some of them will be wide voltage ranges, some will be wide frequency ranges and so forth, and will not be able to reside on a single die, though in some cases, a single die as a 3D monolithic solution could be possible and could be effective. So there are multiple avenues towards heterogeneous integration. Then of course, optimal power management is gonna be critical, especially for remote sensors and areas of that type. Whether you're harvesting data or harvesting energy uh, or you're actually battery operated, it's gonna to have to be very efficient and have intelligence in the power management itself as well as, well as very high efficiency power management. As mentioned earlier, we wanna leverage the human systems and take inspiration from how the human body has become very, very efficient at doing processing. The human brain is one of the most efficient processors. And one of the reasons it is, is that it only does what it needs to do, only sends information and communicates when it, the minimal amount that needs to do. And then we have these hierarchical sensing solutions that help produce the minimal amount of data and assist the brain, so to speak, in doing its job. So when we do this also, we wanna look at how the brain thinks, how our processes, there's machine learning and AI neural networks that people have been looking at for some time. There's compute and memory that can be an analog function actually. And uh, there are some op options for analog synapses. Of course, so there are the, the architectures and algorithms that all lead into that to provide some more intelligence into these sensors. Basically, we need to have a very flexible, scalable, secure platform and technology. This is a big challenge when we look at all these different applications to have something that can apply towards more than one application and still be highly efficient. This is including, again, the sensors, memory, signal representation, and so forth that's matched to the domain of interest, matched to the application space. So these are key areas of required research. As you can see, there's very significant amount of research that needs to be done beyond the scaling of Moore law, Moore's law, which we've been doing for decades. Really, we have to have more focus on what we call more than more and what the industry is calling that. And analog is a key element in that area. Next slide. With that, I wanna thank you for your attention. And I wanna introduce Dave Robertson, Senior Technology Director at Analog Devices, will moderate a roundtable discussion, further exemplifying some of these items in the decadal plan. Thank you. Thanks for doing such a great job of framing the introduction, uh, Jim, and kind of laying the groundwork. As David Isaac mentioned, we've assembled a roundtable of technical experts to explore the key issues 
and implications for research and development for the next five to 10 years to tackle these problems. Um, this group is going to make great use of examples, um, try to illustrate for everybody to sort of see the nature of the problem, the nature of the challenges, and some of the possible solutions. In the spirit of SRC's public-private partnership, you'll see that our panel actually comes from industry, academia, and the government labs. So we're going to have some different perspectives, and we think it's going to take the coordinated effort of all of those sectors to really attack this problem in a meaningful way. I want to start with Dr. Steven Spurgeon, who's going to explore this data deluge from an applications perspective uh, and talk a little bit about sensors that may be quite different than what you're used to. This goes way beyond just uploading more cat videos to the web. So, uh, Dr. Spurgeon. Thank you, Dave and uh, Jim for the introduction and thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. I wanted to emphasize that my, my comments today will be my own. Uh, they don't represent uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, Battelle or the Department of Energy. With that, I wanted to give uh, you know kind of a broad overview of the types of challenges that we tackle uh, in the DOE complex and really some of the motivators uh, for the discussion today. Next slide, please. So the Department of Energy, um, if you're unaware, operates a number of advanced uh, instrumentation uh, capabilities on behalf of the nation. Uh, we operate 27 uh, what are called user facilities. And these are resources for the scientific community to tackle immense problems of great national importance. These encompass a number of different modalities and sensors um, and computing applications, ranging from things uh, like light sources uh, to neutron scattering, cosmology and particle accelerators uh, to theory and sim simulation capabilities. And as you might imagine, the modalities of data, the scales of data that these facilities generate uh, are immense. And so our ability to interrogate and to work with this type of data and to act on this data um, is a tremendous challenge uh, that the Department of Energy, uh, as well as other research institutions have begun to tackle. Next slide, please. So really um, one of the key challenges here uh, is that we have large bandwidth, heterogeneous data from multiple different types of sensors uh, that are being generated at immense rates. So for example here, the types of uh, technologies that we're using in the case of uh, X-ray scattering, we're working with large uh, two-dimensional um, CCD detectors uh, on which we'd like to be able to perform automated data analysis, data reduction, to be able to derive actionable decisions um, and then use that to automate data acquisition to automate commands, for example, to stages, uh, to electronic components, uh, to magnetic uh, field sensors, as well as pressure and temperature sensors. So the kind of things that uh, Jim talked about uh, when we're talking about interacting with the real world, these are the types of challenges that we work with in our facilities. And we'd like to be able to, again, act on these at scale and very quickly. Now, when we talk about other domains, uh, particularly in electron microscopy, there's been an immense explosion in the rates of data generation. So we're able now with advanced detectors to be able to generate data at rates of 10 to the six gigabytes per hour. Um, and this is only scratching the surface of some of the advanced detectors that we're using. So one of our major challenges again here is thinking about the entire workflow from data collection, data reduction to inference and ultimately extracting from that actionable decisions um, that could be made uh, during the scientific process. Next slide, please. Now, one of the key aspects of this is that we need to ground our reduction and our inference in the domain. Uh, this was touched on again in, in Jim's introduction, but really we need to be aware of the domain in which we're operating and we need to be able to incorporate um, multimodal and heterogeneous data sources. So when we talk about, for example, um, particle accelerators and cosmology, we're looking at experimental facilities that are generating data at immense rates, but we need to be able to interpret that data in terms of computation and theory from other facilities. We need to be able to perform simulations and reduction. Um, and for example, using surrogate models and machine learning <coughs> techniques to reduce that data and then ultimately derive decisions in a physics-based context. So as you might imagine, the transport of data, the decision-making process is very heterogeneous, it's very complex. And we're talking about moving data from the cloud to the edge. Um, and to be able to do that requires a rethinking of our um, analog electronic architectures. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, I've identified a few uh, questions and challenges uh, within the application space. 
And really they talk, uh, they relate to how we can embed domain knowledge in the sensing to action workflow. It's not enough that we have this sensor deluge that we're dealing with, but we'd like to be able to ground our reduction and our inference in a physically meaningful framework. Um, in terms of what domain we're operating in, whether it be biology, chemistry, physics, and how can we use that to our advantage to optimize this workflow and this reduction process? Next, how do we effectively harness multimodal analog data streams? And what efficiency gains could we perhaps make from data fusion and redundancy? And what are the unique processing solutions that may emerge here? And then finally, what are the unique uh, co-design um, challenges and, and, and opportunities in specific analytic contexts? For example, are there universal versus domain specific designs? And what are the particular bottlenecks in the data flow and decision-making process that we need to get around? So these are some of the high level questions that we're dealing with uh, across all these different types of instrumentation. And I think it's an immense uh, open challenge that we'd like to tackle. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Stephen. I think we're gonna see a lot of uh, articulation of the need for systems innovation, uh, as Stephen has pointed out. But I wanna kick over to Dr. Mark Rodwell, who's gonna remind us that real world interfaces mean interfacing with the real world. And that can produce a call for device level innovation. So Mark, over to you. Thank you. So I will be speaking about transistors for wireless. Mary, next slide, please. So where is wireless going? In the 5G and the 6G wireless generations, we're gonna be seeing systems where the aggregate capacity, meaning that provided to all of the users being served, is approaching or even exceeding a terabit per second. Why is this happening? Because wireless networks are seeing exploding demand. And of course the industry response has been 5G and then later perhaps what we'll call 6G. What's going on there? We're going to higher frequencies because the FCC will give us lots more spectrum and that alone gives us higher capacity. But there's a double or even quadruple benefit to that in that the higher frequencies also gives us short wavelengths. And so if we make arrays of transmitters of a given physical size, as we go up in frequencies, those arrays get more elements. And so we can make more and more signal beams at the same time. And that doubles and quadruples and beyond our capacity. So in combination with carrier frequencies between 30 and 300 gigahertz, and this many, many beams all at once that's called MIMO or massive spatial multiplexing, we can easily reach or even exceed a terabit per second in either an end hole link, end point link, meaning a hub, or a back hole link. And we can also build imaging radar systems that are approaching video resolution. So let's just take a second to think about that in the cartoons I have below. You'll see a hub or a base station that's shooting signal beams to many, many users. And that's using a transmitter on top of a telephone pole or whatnot that has many, many elements called an array. And that array is shooting out beams to many users using with each user getting their own data stream. And it's using the same shared spectrum over and over again and multiplying the amount of capacity the FCC gives us. In a backhaul links, which is the other cartoons at the bottom of the stream, again, we have arrays of transmitters and arrays of receivers and we're multiplying the available spectrum. In, in imaging, we would like to have, and radar, we would like to have radar systems, both military and civilian applications that allow us to see well in conditions where our eyes can't do it and to drive the capacity to near video resolution. And the high frequencies give us short wavelengths and drive those angular resolutions to the point that we'll get something that starts to approach a low resolution video monitor. In addition, there's a whole slew of applications when hooking up small electronic gadgets for what let's call it beyond Bluetooth at gigabit per second range in the sort of five meter range. Next slide, please, Mary. So CMOS alone won't do it, particularly as the carrier frequencies get above roughly 60 gigahertz. Wireless systems for low power, which is critical, need low noise receivers and need transmitters that have high power for long range and high efficiency. And I won't bore you by leading you through the graphs, but if you look quickly at the plots here of power and efficiency and noise, in some sense, it's surprising how well CMOS is doing near and above 100 gigahertz, but it's not nearly good enough for the applications in any outdoor radio link. 
And so we need to complement CMOS with other things. CMOS VLSI is compromised on all those three parameters. Why? It's because Denard scaling laws are now broken. And faced with that, the industry has, of course, focused on optimizing the transistors for VLSI, which means that the performance to some extent for analog, but to a great extent for wireless is seriously compromised. And so CMOS needs help to cover moderate to long distances, particularly as the carrier frequencies get higher. Mary, next slide, please. So what does wireless need? Wireless needs a technology mix of CMOS everywhere you can use it to good performance, plus other things, indium phosphide, silicon germanium, gallium nitride, to bring in at low integration scales the performance where you critically need it. We need things that are cheap but high performance. Receiver noise is critical because 3dB noise reduction in the receiver is the same as doubling our transmit power. And so that 3dB less noisy receiver saves us two to one in power consumption in our transmitter. For the same reason, efficient transmitters are critical and 30% is the bare minimum acceptable. The transmitters have to be powerful, but not necessarily as powerful as you might think. In a single beam system, you might want one or 10 watts out of your power amplifier, but as soon as one builds arrays, the right number's about a tenth of a watt. In IC technologies, it's emphatic and critical to understand it's not just better transistors, the interconnects matter almost as much in setting the overall IC performance. Finally, I beg you to consider the thought of what constitutes a low cost technology. We cannot rule out technology simply because they are moderate cost today. The question is what could be made cheap if we put our minds to it? What is needed is application specific wireless IC technologies. That includes bringing the three fives as has already been done at gallium arsenide in the cell phone to high volume and low cost, cost production. And that includes the advanced SIGI technology nodes which are only in R&D. It includes also, and we're starting to see these trends already, but they need to accelerate in having a separate branch in the CMOS evolution where you have technologies specifically optimized for the wireless applications. Emerging examples of that today include Global Foundry's 45 nanometer silicon in insulator and Global uh, and Intel's 22 nanometer 22 FFL, which is a wireless optimized FinFET. This also is not enough. We need heterogeneous integration, meaning very high density packaging, where we put CMOS together with other technologies, SIGI and 3.5 whether non-CMOS technology are in the form of chiplets as small as we can make them. The challenges there are integration density because future transceivers are very, very dense, getting the heat out for the same reason and bringing these non-CMOS technologies to the phenomenally low cost that the markets demand. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. Tremendous comments. Uh, astute readers and followers of the Decadal Plan will recognize that, that the wireless applications land both in the communications grand challenge and in the analog grand challenge. And I think that's one of the themes that we'll see is that these different sectors are entangled with one another. Um, important to keep in mind. So let's continue a little bit on the RF theme and bounce up to the system level and look at a different application. Mark mentioned radar. Let's dive a little more deeply into that. Uh, so Costas Doris from NXP is going to explore the issues around radar and some of the imaging things up at the system level. Costas? Thank you, Dave. And hello, everybody. So I'm going to zoom in in the crystal ball of automotive radar sensing. Um, let's change to the next slide, please. And a few messages I would uh, hope that actually the audience takes away after this talk and the uh, discussion is the following, that we need sensors that generate more information, not more data. So this means step to smaller wavelengths and also more functionality in the sensor. Second, as a condition, we need more impact as integration. This is the new cauldron of integration like CMOS was in the past to generate today's automotive radar. 
We also need many heterogeneous technologies and functions co-optimized together, conditioned to the perception function. And I'm going to show you actually, uh, let's say a bit more about that. So next slide, please. So a quick survey around the industry actually leads to the consolidation of you like this. Okay, to enable cooperative sensing for a level five automotive uh, self-driving, we need three sensors, LiDAR, radar, camera, because they complement each other, they address the issue of functional safety. Um, but is that that simple? That's the question. And while I will leave for now the LiDAR, there's a whole path of LiDAR on how to make it affordable, I will zoom in into actually the radar and see the evolution of what happens there. Next slide, please. So looking first on the top left figure, basically in, in, in the automotive industry, there has been a step made from 24 gigahertz to 77 gigahertz, initially in silicon germanium type of chips to explore more resolution, angle and range and velocity in the end. But it was not before we managed to really make that step in millimeter away optimized CMOS, which actually reduced the whole footprint size that actually allowed to do mimics with three by four type of configurations to make a small sensor do cascading and start thinking about MIMO it was not before that step with wave guard antennas combined and antenna impacts already in the beginning that we could actually expand the solution base that the new wavelength actually allowed. And when we did that first step, and this is really in the making, it really is in fact in the deployment in today's industry, we realized of course that there is a whole roadmap ahead of us on how a radar starts being translating into a um, a cognitive radar, but that requires a lot of communication type of techniques. And the question is, how do we enable that? And is, is it that simple as simply saying, I have my 77 gigahertz radar and I do it? Let's move to the next slide. So to do that, basically what we need to address is what we call the issue of mapping localization and classification. And if you want to do that, you need to achieve something that looks like a ladder in terms of angular resolution, 360 degrees view and elevation. You realize you need a massive antenna. Array. You need a very large array, massive in the words actually also Mark presented. And that brings you the question of size. So it's the wavelength, but also the application context. You need to fit it in a car. It needs to have that much power and it needs to operate in 40 milliseconds or the cycle that actually makes this tremendously difficult. Let alone the fact that when we try to introduce communication techniques in radar, we come against the established ecosystem of MCW because that, those type of things don't really match very well together. So what do we do? Next slide, please. There is an opportunity. The opportunity is to use a wavelength and start creating new types of information with that. So I depict here the radar cube. This is a kind of a, a classic way to represent the resolution in the radar domain, range, velocity, angle, fully determined basically by the wavelength and what you can do around it. As we keep increasing the carrier, so reducing the wavelength, suddenly this cube reduces. And as the cube reduces, what we can sense around the environment around us and the object keeps increasing, becoming much more rich in information. Next to that is the fact that we're reaching actually the boundaries of imaging. So we talk about radar ranging, but then radar imaging, your own step ahead. And then you start increasing in frequency and you start realizing you can actually do millimeter wave imaging. So I show you a plot here of a, of a study with, with one of our PhDs with two uh, depth, where actually we, we do really look like, okay, can imaging itself, passive imaging, give you an answer for a, a link budget of 10, 10, 10 meters or something. So what I'm trying to tell you is that it's one thing, the adoption of wavelength. The second thing is that you have much more information available to exploit. So there will be a finer sense of granularity, many different concepts. It's not just leader and radar and camera. But that comes with many challenges, and I want to detail them a bit further in the last slide. The next one, please. So we have four clusters of problems. Top left is the whole problem stem of antenna subsystem. Bottom left is the problem of circuit, silicon. How do you generate this power? Top right is the signal processing you actually need to do to explore all this information. And bottom right is the thing that you need to put all of this together in a package. Starting with the top left, point is, that we need to get power from one point to the other and, and back, right? But at high frequencies, it's so costly to generate power, let alone you want to actually lose it in a transition. So a lot of functionality needs to be moved into the package. And actually, when we start thinking about massive arrays, think about manufacturing issues, tolerances, alignments, all, all that stuff. So where is the trade-off of directivity versus a large array size? How do we make sure we actually start moving into array packages, not antenna packages? 
electronic multimode antennas and, and start using more optical light techniques like millimeter lenses, um, uh, uh, focal plenaries, conformal antennas. So that, that's one cluster of activities that we really need to look forward, bring it in the package as well. Then is the question of, well, okay, where can you use more information, but what else can I do? Well, think about polarimetry. You have a, a target exposed with two different polarizations, you learn already much more about it because it, you get a footprint related to actually the wave, uh, poly, uh, the, the polarization you sent. Okay, so that's one cluster, but this is, needs to be supported by a massive array of transmitter receive chips. And there you come into how you generate this power. There is no single technology that actually can do everything. You need to generate the power and receive with low noise, but you also need to modulate it. And we need radar encryption, practically, specialized waveforms to actually generate it. Next to that comes massive array, but I need to synchronize the full duplex system. I need to cancel actively my reflections because they will jump basically the receiver. So how do I do that? Um, and if I do this, in the end of the day, I have such a massive data rate that I need to do something to reduce it. And this is basically what we would call uh, context or feature extraction in the analog to digital converter. And, and Boris will actually detail that even further later on. Now we go to the right side. Yes, suddenly we have so much more information around the target. I have a massive array. I look it from the left. Uh, receiver, it looks different than when I look at it from the right. So the question of coherency is, is actually needs to be reinterpreted. Then we'll distribute these traders around the car is the question of signal processing for distributed radar. And let alone the fact that actually now the bandwidths are so huge that data processing demands become extremely, extremely high. All in all now, you have an antenna array system that you need to put close to your package or in the package. You have an RF CMOS or a CD or, or, or any other technology that you need to combine together and put it also in the package. And you also have a DSP that requires still this five nanometer or actually whatever else comes ahead of, of uh, um, uh, platforms to really enable it. So how do you put all these things together? It's only the moment we condition all these things together jointly and we manage to put it in this panel that actually we can manage the heat that we'll be able to really unleash the potential of a step to a smaller wavelength, to link it to the step we made to 77 gigahertz. And with that, I would like basically to conclude. Thanks, Costas. I think, I think hopefully the audience is starting to hear some of the themes that Jim pointed out emerge in, in sort of a, a themes that are jumping off the page at us, large arrays, um, it's innovation, not just in the sensor, but in the processing. Um, so let's shift gears a little bit, with no pun intended, over to Wiley and have a look at some of the other applications. Remind us of the importance of sensor fusion. It's a topic that Costas just touched on. Um, I'd like Wai to explore that a little bit more. Over to you, Wai. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, this is uh, why uh, I would like to spend the next uh, few minutes uh, to highlight some of the opportunities ahead in the intelligence uh, sensing and the sensor fusion areas. Next slide, please. I would like to use the uh, SLC funded project on motor health monitoring to illustrate the importance of uh, multimodal sensing and sensor fusion. To support the Industry 4.0, different sensing modality have been explored to detect various uh, motor uh, faults. This modality, modality includes uh, vibration, temperature, magnetic flux, as well as uh, current. Study have shown each of these modality have its own strength and weakness to detect a particular fault, whether it's a broken magnet or a shorted uh, widening. By using a combination of these sensing modalities, the fault detection on the health monitoring become much more robust. However, this also creates the data, data deluge uh, challenge that Jim and Arthur have highlighted uh, earlier. On this slide, I listed a few areas of uh, improvements for us to further the advance of, of the, the usability of the motor health monitoring application. But I also believe this area are equally applicable for other sensing applications and uh, they are, represent exciting uh, research areas in the next 10 years. To start off, processing at the edge of this sensor to outputs, uh, uh, to start off uh, processing at the edge of this sensor to output 
uh, if uh, efficient data stream to transfer to the cloud and also to be used in a motor control loop have yet to be developed. AI techniques can potentially be used on sens sensor data from different modality to pinpoint the exact fault conditions. Another area of research is on how sensors can monitor themselves to ensure they continue to function and perform within specs over their lifetime. This is an important area for many industrial applications, as well as uh, in automotive, particularly in autonomous uh, driving. Hardware redundancy has been the main approach to partially address this challenge. However, I believe we can do better and find other innovative way to improve the system reliability by using pattern recognitions and other techniques. Last but not least, uh, is in the area of data security. How do we protect data integrity by implementing uh, low complexity and energy efficient algorithms uh, at the edge to protect the data? So uh, next page. Uh, I want to turn the attention to uh, on the complexity sensing. This is one of the important techniques for us to adjust the data deluge uh, change in the past decades, impressive progress has been made in compressive sensing. Significant power saving in system application have been demonstrated in imaging, audio, health applications by compressive sensing techniques. These techniques exploit the sparsity in real world signals and applications. The example I saw on this slide is our work on ECG applications. Uh, as you can see, ECG signal have uh, sparsity in time domain. By using an adaptive sampling weight, we can greatly reduce the power from traditional light persuade uniform uh, samplings. In the next decade, I believe there are two research directions that we should continue our progress in this area. In some way, these two directions are opposite to each other. First direction is how we can make this compressive sensing techniques more generalized by having intelligence in figuring out and exploiting the signal sparsity. For example, can machine learning techniques allow us to have real-time adaptive uh, signals uh, sparsity detections and compressive sensing? On the other uh, extremes, uh, we also need to have a more holistic and system level uh, perspective in determining what is useful information in this, in the eye of this A to I that we are referring to. And this eye may actually vary from application and also may vary uh, uh, even uh, uh, in, in, uh, in different time of the same applications, right? So these two extremes represent a trade-off between so ultimate flexibility versus ultimate optimization. We probably need a solution at both ends and also in between these two extremes as well. Uh, so with that, I will uh, uh, end my uh, brief introduction here. Thanks, Wei. Uh, I think we're, we're starting to see now, Wei's kind of shifted us over to talk more and more about the uh, intelligence at the edge and what it takes to get to inference. And that's a theme that's kind of showed up a number of times. Uh, Boris, I know you've done a large amount of work in there, so let's let's go over to you and get your thoughts on dimensional reduction and processing at the edge. Thank you very much, Dave. Yes, I will reinforce some of the things you just heard from Wei, and I will also circle back to some of the things that Jim pointed out in the beginning from a, from a fundamental perspective. So next slide, please. So the one distinction I want to make is between the traditional applications that many of us have worked on over the past few decades having to do with communication. The important thing to realize is that in communication, we actually design the signals and we purposely design them to carry a lot of information bits per symbol or per sample. And so it's actually okay to digitize each sample and extract that information directly. However, when you talk about a lot of these emerging applications that have to do with um, interpreting raw data, let it be audio, let it be video and so on, 
this unstructured data has very few information bits per sample that you take. And here I'm just putting up audio. Jim had video, but for audio, it's known, for example, that human speech conveys no more than 39 bits per second. Yet, if we sample it and dump it into a processor, we tend to acquire hundreds of kilobits per second. And so there are many of these applications out there that have high dimensionality, either in time, uh, in space, or in frequency. And for these new applications that are growing over time, it doesn't make sense to use the same old uh, signal path that was designed for communication. So this is not to say that these signal paths will not go away. Well, they will stay and they will become more significant as well as, as Mark alluded to, and we need to make them faster and so on. But there's a second class that we need to pay attention to as well. So next slide. So when you look at this class of applications, really they, they give you this picture of drinking from a fire hose. There's a lot of uh, bits coming in, many of them don't mean a whole lot. And so you're well advised to try to do some kind of dimensionality reduction up front. And this is just a general term for many different things you can think about. You heard the term compressed sensing, maybe in the communication side, this could be thought of as subarray beam forming. There's many of these different ideas that are around, but increasingly, given that we have arrays of sensors, antennas and so on, we need to worry more about this upfront uh, reduction. And so that brings the data to a, ma a manageable amount and then you refine as you go through the signal chain with memory and compute and decision making to really extract what's, what's essential for your, for your application. Um, what this leads to is, is what I call a new paradigm. It's really a domain specific and data driven architecture design because you didn't design the data. The data tells you how to design your systems. It's the other way around. Um, what's important in this, in this scheme um, is, is to go back to uh, uh, sort of understand what we know from previous incarnations of these interfaces. One, data conversions are expensive. Data movement is expensive. Memory access is expensive. Uh, furthermore, uh, there may be a nice trade-off between uh, combining analog and digital for low energy processing. So I have a couple of cartoons here. As it's well understood, uh, the, the middle chart, analog computation is actually quite efficient when the SNR is low, say 30 dB and, and below. Analog is almost unbeatable in terms of energy you get per compute or filter operation. Whereas at high uh, fidelity, higher bit widths, digital becomes superior because you start drowning in thermal noise and overcoming that thermal noise uh, energy uh, starts to cost you. And then on the right is again, just to reiterate, one of the biggest issues in almost all modern systems, no matter how big they are, no matter at what uh, length scale you look, moving bits around is holding us back. Moving bits is extremely expensive on chip, it's expensive off chip, and it's expensive on the, on the larger scale between data centers and so on. And so hitting memory and moving bits is something to avoid. And, and this really lets us uh, focus back on, on really reducing the, this movement and, and storage and so on. So on the next slide, I just want to illustrate, not that I want to go into all the details, but in the last five, six years, my group has worked on some domain specific ideas uh, using these principles basically to ask, what can we do upfront to reduce the data? What domain specific insights are there to reduce the data reduce the number of A to D conversions, data movement, memory access, and so on. So we've done that for a number of applications, predistorter spectrum sensing, um, image uh, classification, ultrasound imaging, RF spectrum sensing, audio feature extraction, neural recording, and then just low fidelity neural network compute. Um, and we've reported impressive gains, but what I will tell you on the next slide, and this is, uh, uh, please go to the next slide. An issue that, that uh, Wei also mentioned is that, well, none of these techniques are particularly general that we develop. They're extremely domain specific. And the question that comes up, especially for a company that needs to be profitable, how do we generalize these things and amortize the R&D across uh, multiple applications? So this is one of the grand challenges. So always in hardware design, 
Uh, you can get efficiency by customization, but when you push the customization too far, it gets too expensive. So this is something that we need to think about. The other issue, and this is something that's really starting to bother us in the system, is that how do we figure out what the circuit requirements are? So when I design a radio system, it's actually difficult enough what noise figure I need in my LNA and so on. You know, that, that even takes me some time to figure out. But in these systems where I don't even know what the signals are and the information is really extracted only after massive and massive processing, it becomes really difficult to know what the SNR of your blocks need to be. And often you need to run uh, simulations for months. That's what we had to do in some of these systems that I showed on the, on the previous slide. Um, the other issue is architectural exploration. So the, the signal chains uh, can differ quite a bit from what we're used to, right? Amplifier, filter, A to D, DSP. You can now combine these in different orders and you can do different levels of dimensionality reduction at different places. Um, how do you figure out what's optimal? Uh, this is extremely difficult and often confusing. And as an example, I want to mention some of you may be working on neural networks. Uh, the, there's a big hype right now about neural network architecture search. And often the computer scientists, they drive these optimizations by the number of network model weights. It turns out this is a very bad proxy because even if you have a network with small number of weights, it may have a huge amount of data movement which is not optimal. So it's actually very difficult to figure out what we're even optimizing um, in these systems. So lastly, you know, given all these difficult problems, how do you find someone to work on this? So you need someone who understands transistors and noise and, 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 and chip, chip design, physical design, but at the same time is comfortable uh, running training on a, on a GPU uh, and so on. So broadening out for the people that we educate has become extremely important. And I've been trying to achieve this with some of my students recently, and it has led uh, to longer completion times on, on their PhD, undoubtedly. And so it's not clear how this will scale in the future uh, either, because it is a different story when someone just had to design a better A to D. Well, now they're designing an A to D and a machine learning backend, and they're training this and they're analyzing it. It gets extremely complicated. Um, so funding also comes to mind as a, as a showstopper in this, in this context. Anyway, so thank you. This was my short pitch. Thanks, Boris. I think that you've, you've left us with some thoughts on the notion of talent um, for this grand challenge that I definitely want to come back to. Um, so I'm going to hold, I'm going to be back at you in a minute for that. Um, and again, I think we are, we will, I encourage people to use the Q&A channel within this rather than this, the chat that gives us better question retention. And there are a couple of things coming in that I wanna work through. I also wanna come back to though, I think Jim laid the notion of this reduction uh, of data in five orders of magnitude, uh, which is a big challenge, but a number of, a number of the panelists then mentioned uh, wider bandwidths and huge arrays. So we go from an array of 32 antennas to hundreds. And uh, so that seems to be making the problem worse before we make it better. So I wonder if we get some comment on, on some of this stuff as we go to arrays and massively parallel sensors. Mark, I know you're doing a lot of work in that area. Can we touch on that? Yeah, so let's, let's move on to that. So I have a few more thoughts on on oops, we did we lose? Sh should I share my own screen, Mary? Sarah, we can go. No, no, Sarah, we can go back. If we can go back to Mary, I think Mark's got a couple of slides he can jump us back to. So, Mary, if you can go ahead and share those. Okay. Yep. All right. So, um, so next slide, please. Okay. So there are some points here I'd like to make about wireless, and surprisingly. What we find in wireless is true across analog and VLSI as well. So first, let's talk about something very specific to structure the problem before we move on. In building wireless systems, I've got a cartoon of a plane and some people wandering around on the ground. And the point is there are many kinds of wireless links. A, a plane might um, have a radio link that needs to steer horizontally and vertically over wild field, wide field of view. A wireless hub needs to steer to people on, on the ground. They're neither floating in space 
nor are they in a hole in the ground. So it needs to steer only horizontally, not vertically. A point to point link actually does need electronic beam steering because there's inevitably errors. It's not aimed properly when you inst installed it. And so it needs to steer over a few degrees. So all of these things need a raise. And the key thing to understand is to steer in two, two, dimension, two planes, you need a two dimensional array at half wavelength spacing. Now, when you go to high frequencies, that becomes very small. And so your problems are, how do I fit in the electronics? How do I avoid high frequency wiring losses when I do that? And given there's a lot of electronics in a small space, how do I get all of the heat out? But it's really critical to understand that that problem is worse when we have to steer over two planes, which is some, two, a horizontal and a vertical plane, which is like the case of the aircraft cartoon that I've shown you here. And then that requires a two dimensional array. And so things have to be very, very densely packed. In something like that wireless hub that's talking to people on the ground, it only needs to steer in one plane. So we have a linear array. And although the elements in the array are very densely spaced, there's plenty of space on the two sides of the array to fit in the electronics. So wireless systems are driving very high integration densities, but the specifics of the systems are varying the degree of severity of the problem. Next slide, please. Now let's sort of step back and look at the overall picture, trying to do what, say, Gordon Moore did with VLSI electronics and look at a 30-year future history. So let's try to do the same for wireless. What's going to happen as we move to the future? What's going to happen is we're going to get more and more and more channels. And each channel has to be lower and lower power, physically smaller, and lower cost. Why is that? And the answer is, there's a bit of the math at the top, which I will skip, except to give you the formula. And that tells you that as we increase the frequencies, if we keep the area of the transmitter and the receiver arrays the same, the capacity of the system is going to go up. So a very simple design principle here is if we double the frequency, we should keep the areas of the transmitter and receiver arrays the same. But the spacings get smaller. So each time we double the frequency, the areas stay the same. We quadruple the number of elements. So we get, end up getting vast number of elements. So this is the trend. High frequency arrays have a vast number of elements, even though they're transmitting and receiving the same amount of power. So the number of elements is going up. But even so, the power per channel is going down. In that way, it's very, very similar to what's happening, say, with microprocessors, where we're going to massive parallelism. So what this means is we need dense IC packaging for these arrays. We need ICs where the signal channel can fit into smaller and smaller areas. We need efficient, low power, high frequency circuit design. We're going to be dealing with arrays that are receiving maybe 10 or 20 signals, but have thousands of elements. So this is somewhat similar to Boris's problem of how do we efficiently process that and what kind of dynamic range and A to, A to D resolution do we need for each cha uh, channel. Next slide, please. I'll try to be quicker and more succinct. I'm struggling a bit, I apologize. So the second point is in high performance IC technologies, it's the same in wireless as it is in VLSI. An advanced IC technology is not just a better transistor, it's also a better wiring environment. We need interconnects that are low loss, we also need interconnects that are high density. In CMOS VLSI, we have the high density, but the loss is bad. In the 3.5 and GAN technologies, we have low loss, but the density is bad. Why is that an issue? Because we need to fit a whole transceiver in a small area to physically integrate the system. That's one. The other is if our interconnect pitch is large, high frequency power transistors have a lot of fingers. And if the interconnect pitch is bad, those fingers are widely separated and the wires between them are lossy. And this applies not only in connecting fingers together to make a 50 ohm power cell, but in connecting multiple power cells together to build a power amplifier. So concisely is the path to low loss and high efficiency is short wires. And short wires means high integration density, which means a good backend wiring stack. Um, next and final slide, please. So I'll just give you one specific case of the, the issue in data reduction. In massive MIMO, you have hundreds of receiver channels, and you may be dealing with 20 or 30 receiver signals. And one's first intuition, which was reflected in the literature, 
is you have massive dynamic range challenges in both the analog and the digital and mixed signal portions. Third order intercepts, noise figures, phase, or phase noise and A to D resolution. But the fact the number, that the number of RF channels is substantially larger than the number of signals that you're receiving is that the array is spatially oversampled and you're obtaining a signal to noise ratio gain in doing so. And so in combination, these factors are making the digital beam forming and the RF and analog and mixed signal design of these systems less complex and less challenging than was first anticipated. And so this is a general principle again in wireless and may extend to other domains as we're dealing with larger and larger number of physical channels, but the same overall aggregate information demands. And so the dynamic range and the resolution per channel is decreasing. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Maybe a glimmer of hope there. Um, I think for the last 40 years, so much of a the mixed signal domain has the the challenge has been to digitize it as quickly as you can and do all the processing in the digital domain. I think Boris, that changed why you introduced the notion of stop talking about A to D and let's talk about A to I, analog to information. Um, can we can we come back to a little that a little bit on the analog to information and and how we get how we get to there? Is there do we, do we have to change the way we're coming at it? Um, Boris, why? Um... Yeah, um, certainly. I mean, I think the, the development process is very different for this A2I approach. The first thing you need to figure out is what, what are the specifics of the domain, the signals and the information that, that you're interested in? And that in itself is actually a longer study before you can even think about designing a chip um, and yeah, it, it, it's an expensive exercise. Perhaps uh, why I can say a little bit about this from, a, from an industry perspective, because I'm, I'm thinking that he may be more sensitive about this. I, as an educator, I actually like it as a tool to make students think differently and think them, make them think hard over a few years. Um, but when you have a development cycle, I think um, this is easier said than done. And why I think that that's both the eight I and the flexibility and optimization questions that you both you astutely brought both those points up. Yeah, just like uh, Boris hinted, right? I guess uh, that on, on one hand that uh, uh, that we will people have predicted will have billions and billions of these uh, uh, sensors. So how how you uh, uh, get information out of it? I saw. Uh, 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 Rick posed a question, how we maximize the, the information. And I'm actually not so sure we actually uh, necessarily need to aim to maximize the, the information. I think we, I, I'm, maybe I'm just lazy. I'm more on, 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 the, on, the, on the side of, we just need to get the bare minimum of the information that we need for whatever application, the end application we need to write. So we actually get back to the change that, that Boris pointed out, right? That that uh, uh, on each application that um, saw sort of the, the 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 requirement or the boundary condition are very different. That is also a change that we face in the industry. How you balance this thing? Right? So at this point, I don't have a, a crystal ball or how we all, all ended up. But it's, I think it's a change that we we must face, and 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 we, we need to do a lot more work on this. And Stephen, I want to loop you back in here because this was one of the points that you explored in your opening comments about how we how we can combine information, how we get insight sooner up and down the traditional signal chain. So can can you offer some further commentary or connect some of these dots for us? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that this is something it's it's a huge challenge again in terms of you know being able to access past work, being able to use perhaps Bayesian approaches to interpret the data that, that we're, we're generating and to use that to guide experimentation. Um, I think that, you know, there is, the approaches vary so, so greatly between domains. And oftentimes we're generating a lot of data, but not extracting a lot of information or knowledge from it. And so I think that there needs to be a recognition of that at the start of the process. 
And we need to try to you know, establish best practices. For example, in some communities, the X-ray diffraction community, there are well-established standards for this versus other communities, electron microscopy being one, um, you know, there, are, there are very few uh, standards in many cases for this type of process. And so we're acquiring all this data, perhaps unnecessarily, or uh, tossing it out or extracting very little useful and actionable knowledge from it. So this is a, a debate that's gonna vary from community to community, but it's, it's absolutely essential um, that we address it early on in the process. Mary, can you bring slide seven back up onto the screen? This was something that, that Jim put out on the table um, that maybe resonates to this theme and puts an image in people's mind. Um, so Mary, if you're out there, can you share slide seven with us? Um, Cause, and which talks a little bit about this notion of the local intelligence versus the cloud intelligence, the local storage versus the global storage, or maybe we can act on information before storing it at all. And Costas, you talked about the automotive application and certainly um, in a normal vehicle and certainly in an autonomous vehicle, we can't necessarily wait and sustain the latency to see whether we can consult the cloud as to whether we should apply the brakes or not. So yes, and I'm wondering whether you can offer some comment on that. And, and Jim raised the issue of the cost of storing and communicating this information, which comes back to your point, Floris, about you also mentioned the cost of memory access. I'm wondering whether some of the panelists can kind of comment on this picture and some of the insights on the cost functions and, and other things about where and how we do the processing. So cost us. Yes, I would like to add one dimension of the problem, maybe not well, it's application dependent, of course, is the, the question of functional safety. That is, one thing is, of course, to develop a context in, in a sense that actually makes an interpretation. But the other thing is actually to, how to guarantee that, how to ensure that actually in given, with a given reliability, basically, you can guarantee that this is, is not erroneous. So this, this is another element in the industry, specific industry, that actually is creating a lot of yeah, let's say slow adoption, if you will, or will certainly certainly have some conservatism is to into into accepting this type of concepts. So that's that's another element I want to to mention. Then then of course there is. I can give you a simple example. So I I, I can make a radar at say 150 gigahertz or around that frequency, and I want to keep it. Uh, it it's a massive right. It's massive element, and I need to distribute. An FMCW signal, maybe that won't be easily possible. So I need to switch to a phase coding, and suddenly I have such a huge amount of data just to make and just a single correlation. So I have a fine grid, the data cube as I showed before, and this this number of data is basically blowing up the whole the whole processor. So how how do I find ways to simply do it somewhat differently? Which require on one side the feature extraction potentially, but also to really squeeze out the optimal degrees of freedom in the way that I do the MIMO orthogonality and maybe on, on taking things differently in the sensor. So I see it as a very multidimensional problem and it's not easy to say one will actually address that or the other. And developing methodologies at the moment are very, very difficult. At least that, that's why it's a question for research, obviously. Mm. There was one of the questions that came in about um neural nets and whether obviously the AI things have come up a couple different times and whether neural nets and analog implementations of those uh, offer some efficiencies or some of this dimensional reduction. Um, any comment on, on processing and what processing belongs in the analog domain, digital domain, charge domain, voltage domain. There were some other questions about whether we need to think about signal processing in different domains differently? So first off, you left off one domain and, and that's in a high frequency circuit. We're dealing in neither the voltage nor the current domain, but with the, the, the combined domain where the ratio of voltage to current is mm -hmm. Z naught equals 50 ohms. <laughs> yep. So, and, you, and you'll never pull off a high frequency circuit if you ignore that. But, uh, but yeah, I now step down. Uh, there's a lot of information in the electromagnetic space too. So in the, in the magnetic, I thought you were going to take me there, Mark. But. No, it's funny and, and I digress, but you can map it all to analog de design by recognizing there are 
simple relationships between waves and voltages and currents, but nevertheless, any- they all come back to Maxwell is, eventually. Yeah. yeah, has got to talk to 50 ohms. Maybe I can talk about neural nets a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, no, as to whether analog makes sense, I think the jury is still out. Uh, definitely when you do dimensionality reduction at the, at the very front, there's gotta be some analog stuff happening, but whether it makes sense to go back to analog, that's not well established yet. Uh, people are playing with compute in memory and there's arguments that this has some benefits, but to be honest, it's not perfectly proven yet. Um, machine learning thrives on flexibility because the algorithms are changing constantly. And with one platform, you want to cover different algorithms. And a lot of these customizations that we make to enable analog processing take away that, that flexibility. And it also becomes less possible uh, to, to, to do dynamic um, sparsity management and, and things of that sort, which is relatively easy uh, in, in digital. On top of this, since machine learning in any case is, is limited by moving the bits, it is not always obvious how the way you compute can, can change the trade-offs. Uh, the only thing you can hope is that if you have massively parallel computation that perhaps you can have different data movement, but it turns out that no one knows yet how to compare these things uh, well. Oftentimes when you go to conferences, things are compared in a very unfair way. People compare apples and oranges and claim victory. So there are papers emerging. I was on one recent paper where we talked about how to compare accelerators because none of this is actually established. Everyone has their own metrics. Um, Dave and I were on a panel recently on figures of merit for ADCs. And some people think that that it's bad for ADCs, but I can tell you in machine learning, it's a hundred times worse. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a gaming of, of figures of merits like you haven't seen it before. So we, we haven't really converged yet on even, yeah, comparing these things in a fair way. So we can't say what's better at this point. Dave, I'd like to have added comment to that if I can. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, I think in what Boris highlights, at least what comes to mind is that something I raised early on is the system approach. You really need to look at what the value is of doing any of these things in digital or analog and even of accelerators, as Boris pointed out. It, in the total system, you may find that you have a, an analog or a, a neural net accelerator that's phenomenally efficient, but it still needs to be surrounded by access information, access interfaces. There's got to be some controller CPU in the overall system. And it goes back to how do we look at all those pieces and learn where that value proposition is in order to be able to best develop a system that kind of looks at that balance between flexibility and optimal design and efficiency. Which brings us back to something that I think almost all the panel has touched on directly or indirectly, which is that the call for this seems to involve trade-offs and optimizations across multiple domains circuit and device, uh, circuit and system, process and device, software, the cost of data movement versus, versus that, functional safety constraints and things like that. So, and Boris touched on this point and I, I promised I wanted to get back to it and I do, which is, uh, is there anybody that, that's, that, that can be that smart? Or Boris, you say you want to, keep your PhD students for a few more years to get them to where they need to know all this stuff. Does that mean that uh, to, to get your PhD, you're going to be 80 years old and you know, we need to work on healthcare to extend the lifetime of individuals so that they can know enough to actually innovate in this space. Uh, what, what, what are the thoughts? Mark, I know that uh, you've had to direct uh, an SRC jump comm center across multiple domains and not only herd cats, but get cats to play with dogs and elephants, um, which is a much bigger challenge. Comments so, on that and how we attack this in the next five years. So, so I, I don't think it's really hard to be broad enough to understand the whole of electrical engineering, let alone the, the whole of human knowledge. But, but even understanding the whole computer problem is hard as is understanding say the whole wireless problem. But, in our wireless center, for example, we've done that pretty well. We have transistor groups, we have circuit design groups, packaging, which is a lot of electromagnetics, and both applied and very theoretical signal processing groups. 
and there's a lot of interaction between them and you, you, you encourage grad students to take who are specialized in X, in, in, in information area N, to be well educated in N plus one and N minus one in the technology chain as well. Otherwise it's absolutely hopeless. So, so you, you really do need that. And, and a lot of the, um, forgive me, nuttiest ideas that are proposed in the research community come from people who lack that sufficient breadth of knowledge uh, to understand the relevance of their proposed ideas. Some, some of the sort of nuttiest ideas coming out of the academic transistor community come from people who've not been forced to learn um, at least a reasonable level of circuit design, for example. So I'll pass that off to Boris to, to carry the ball from there. Well, I mean, uh, the, the health insurance uh, outcome or the health insurance problem, it's actually worse, Dave. So what I've seen in the last few students is that I really wanted them to do this co-design of hardware and then algorithm and so on. And after a couple of years, they decide that the knobs are way bigger on the algorithm side and they want nothing to do with IC design anymore. So they find out that coming up with a better algorithm gives them 10x. And then this, this chip design, you know, gives them 2 dB, why would they bother? So yeah, and, and, and industry salaries are an important figure of merit too, right? So I think we need to pay attention. Yeah. We need, Stephen, I, the, the labs have a, you guys are looking for deep, deep, deep insight on some things. How does the breadth play in, um, in, in working these problems across the labs? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, we, we've got partnerships through Energy Frontier Research Centers, for example, where we're bringing together multidisciplinary groups to tackle this. I think Boris is absolutely right. You know, you just, you simply can't specialize in, in all the necessary knowledge. And so we're trying to bring together these multidisciplinary teams. And, and there's been a number of roundtable discussions uh, within DOE, um, bringing in the industry perspective, bringing in the academic perspective. We see this now more and more and the calls that are being issued um, that this perspective is necessary. And I think moving forward, we're gonna definitely have to, to do that just because of the, the, the rate of knowledge and, and the growth of that knowledge is, has been immense. Simulations, models, abstraction layers, what role does that play in kind of coming at this and, and allowing communication across domain boundaries? Um, Costas, thoughts on that in the oh. industry side? Well, yes, maybe one wants to back first of all. So I, I think maybe we need to quit from the aspiration to have a student finishing a PhD knowing two domains so well, but actually embed into his mind the notion that in the rest of his career, he needs to continuously explore at least trying to marry two fields together. What I do see in our teams is we, we really do that. It's necessary. There is no way out of it. We're talking about a, a very multidisciplinary teams working together, electromagnetic, circuit guys, uh, system, radar signal processing, DSP guys, mixed signal, analog digital, that's already hard enough for an engineer to really absorb. So it starts with the notion that this is important and I need to keep doing it for many, many years and then keep working on it in, in this environment that, that actually nurtures it. And that's what I see actually the big benefit is it, I don't see it in the beginning. I don't expect to have a person in, in, in our teams being able to do that from birth of his, uh, let's say, or the end of his PhD, I do expect the attitude and I see that after five, 10 years, actually continuously grinding these processes, talking to all this multidisciplinary that he develops or she develops, yeah, that, that, that interconnecting uh, uh, ability. So I find this very, very important to, to be nurtured in the years to come after, rather than expecting to, to do that in a PhD. So, so I have one other comment related to the educational level, and it's a battle that I'm presently fighting and losing. It is I have colleagues who are pointing to the high salaries of the AI people and all the software people, and they're therefore driving our undergraduate program and everything else along with it to uh, focus on mathematics rather than physics. And, and yet I see people talking about energy harvesting from a single temperature, not understanding the second law of thermodynamics. You know, we talked about 50 ohms versus analog design and, and Maxwell's equations. And, and it all comes down to the fact that capacitance is really a transmission line that's terminated on neither end. And, and uh, under what levels of system design does it make sense to terminate it in 50 ohms and have it be fast but dissipate all, all the power all the time versus not terminate it and have it be slow and only dissipate when you switch? 
it, you, you need some level of understanding of, of the underlying physics to, to understand both basic physics, to understand transistor design and to understand circuit design, including how it interfaces with, with interconnects. So that remains really important. And I know that I'm missing something here that's been driving me nuts. I'll shut up and see if it comes to me in a minute. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> the, the, yeah. the challenge of making physics cool again um, is is definitely is definitely in there and important. I think that's to to be honest, that's that's one of the things that that the SRC is trying to do in the articulation of the grand challenges and and in that spirit of the moonshot to capture the imagination of those that are thinking and sort of say there are some really really fascinating problems and. And this is where this is where the action is. So I think uh, so I think that's definitely one of the things. And that kind of come back comes back to there was I'll paraphrase a geopolitical question that came in through there about um, in the U.S. ecosystem, including labs, including academia. How does that compare to what's going on in other parts of the world? What what are we doing well? What are we doing poorly that we might need to to adjust. So I, again, I'll, I'll be jumping quick, fast, and then shut up is, is I'm maybe not the oldest person here, but frightfully, I'm getting to be close there. And my accent tells you that I didn't come from here. So in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and sort of blurring away in, in that period, with all due respect to the rest of the world, the US university system in science and engineering was the place to be. Um, it was not only the most money, but it had the least bureaucracy and the most focus on excellence and getting the job done. And, and over a lifetime in this business, what I'm seeing is, is the US educational system is still something to be proud of, but it's um, you know, the, that, that huge gap over the rest of the world has, has vanished. Um, and, and maybe maybe that's okay, um, but it, it's something we really need to understand. It's very good, very good thought to toss out there in the in the last five minutes. Other other comments on that from from other panelists. Jim, your perspectives, perhaps why? Yeah, I was going to provide a comment there, Dave, as well, because uh, you know one of the things, and I think Mark pointed out this to some extent, is that. The United States has been losing ground in a certain sense, and we understand, and the government now is becoming extremely aware of this. Uh, there's a lot of communication and looking at what other funding can be pushed into the semiconductor industry from an R&D perspective. Uh, some of the other countries are just investing a tremendous amount more in this space to try to close that gap that Mark identified. And this is one of the things we need to do. And one of the purposes of the decadal plan is to really identify where we need to invest, where we can get the biggest impact from the research that we can be doing in the semiconductor industry in order to try to increase that gap or at least maintain our leadership that we've been holding on to for a number of years. So, uh, yeah, I think that that's, that's interesting. I think there was a question about, you know, our, even though the device is going to be produced in Asia, are they going to produce elsewhere? And there's a big push uh, to get more done within the U.S. And I think that that's another way we can take and maintain leadership is to make sure we're understanding both the applications and the technology and the manufacturing capabilities that are necessary in order to maintain that leadership. So um, forgive me, I'll shut up and stop dominating, but you said a, you, you, you hit a hot button there, so I need to touch on that. I think we all understand, and you're seeing it in wireless, but in all of these things, as, as the IC technology scaling is getting harder, much more of the system improvement is coming from integration and packaging. And that's incredibly slow. Uh, so in wireless, it may be so in the other fields. Trying to want, run a wireless research center with university input, but even talking to our industrial supporters, um, almost all of the packaging and integration is overseas. And this, you know, is this okay if increasingly we're just running the CAD designs and shipping it overseas, or are we going to lose control because of this? Um, so, so leadership in packaging and having at least some fraction of the events packaging in the U.S., 
Um, it, it might be an Achilles heel to the wire, to 5G wireless. Um, you know, this is being discussed. Well, and and uh, I think not just wireless. I think uh, Costas emphasized the heterogeneous integration and the notion of being able to access that. I think one of the things in the 90s in the semiconductor boom, um, the notion of MOSIS and broad access to that, being able to build things and play with that, that extended back into academia, small companies, things like that. The equivalent of what that looks like in heterogeneous integration is a fascinating topic. And potentially it's lurking in there in the CHIPS Act funding on national labs, but it really all depends on how it's done. I think we've also all seen that that money can be you you can waste billions and 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 not get big impact. So I am mindful that we are at the at the ninety minute mark. Uh, we still have a healthy audience here. There are still questions, which we again we will work on. Yes, I, the SRC and SIA on the webinar will work on getting responses posted to these questions and other thoughts. Um, kind of one last go around for anyone that that uh, needed to get one last closing comment in and then anyone feel like one last thing, get the last word in? Well, um, all right, well with that then, I wanna thank uh, all participants again for this rich discussion, the audience, for the great questions kind of coming in and your attention. Uh, as has noted, this is the second in the webinar series and we intend to go through all five of the grand challenges. And just remind, remind everybody that we are in the opening phases of the decadal planning process and really activating this um, through to, to make these things. I think Boris showed an interesting slide that talked about you know, factors of 40, factors of, of 100 in improvement in this dimensional reduction. Still some healthy work to do to get the five orders of magnitude that Jim articulated. So uh, the, the challenge is out there now and the discussion is ongoing. And I wanna thank everybody for their time. Jim, I'll hand it back to you for, for an official close. Yep, thank you, Dave. And thank you all the panelists. I think everybody did a great job on their intro remarks as well as uh, the, the Q&A that we had going. And I also want to thank the audience for listening in and holding on uh, during this hour and a half, 90 minutes that we've been having here. Again, the Decadal Plan is meant to help provide some guidance and direction on where we need to go in the future. And Dave, I want to thank you for your excellent moderating of the, the session. And uh, thanks, everybody. <laughs>